It's fitting today that we finish our uh, series on the Exodus. I know there's more to the book of Exodus, but we're going to, this is, we're going to conclude today and uh, pick up, God willing, maybe a year from now, we'll, we'll see what they've been up to since they left Egypt. But it's fitting that we conclude today with this story, the greatest story before, before what we're really celebrating today, the resurrection of Christ, the salvation of men by the, the, by the sacrifice of Christ. Before this, the, the greatest story of salvation brought by God in history, in my humble opinion, has got to be this story. And I think there's, there's plenty of evidence to back this statement up because the Old Testament time and time again reminds us of what God did on this day, saving the Israelites, bringing them through the sea. We've been following uh, Moses' mission to save the Israelites, the sons of Jacob, from bondage in Egypt. And we've been through the, the ten plagues. And we've seen Pharaoh's hard heart. And we've seen... Uh, uh, many instances where uh, anybody would have plenty of reason to give up. Say, I made a mistake coming to try to do this. And, uh, uh, or we made a mistake trusting Moses. Or, or maybe God's not real. Or, or maybe he loves someone more than me. But now we have seen that God has kept his promise. Moses was indeed the man chosen for this mission. And the Israelites were loved by God and they received his mercy and they have been freed from their bondage and everything seemed just fine uh, when they left uh, but in chapter 13 we're told that uh, uh, the story is about to get a little more dramatic we thought we had reached the climax and they were, they were going to live happily ever after but then we're told that God didn't lead them through the, the, the highway to Canaan because the Philistines were there. They could have just gone right up the coast of the Mediterranean. If you, if you have a map in your Bible, you can look up uh, Old Testament uh, maps and see the shortest way from Egypt to Canaan, where the, where the Israel was going to plant. They could have just gone straight up the Mediterranean coast. But there were, there were Philistines there, and they did not take kindly to strangers, let alone hundreds of thousands of strangers, because they saw that as an army ready to conquer, and they were going to fight. And you understand, Israel, the, the Jews, had no uh, battle training. So God was gracious and merciful to not put them in that situation. Are you thankful for the times God helps you avoid terrible situations? In the Sunday school class, Randy, we talked about suffering. Uh, and, and we understand suffering goes along with Christianity, goes along with our faith. And, and, and we, we know we have had plenty of times of suffering, but we also have to be honest and say, God has kept me from more suffering than I really deserve. Is that, is that right? And so God kept the Israelites from more suffering. They'd suffered enough. And see, but but it, what that meant was it's going to take longer to get to where they've got to go. So he leads them a different way. He leads them through the wilderness. And Moses points out something else. In, in telling this story in verse 19 of chapter 13 says they took the bones of Joseph with them do you remember who Joseph was he was the the son of Jacob who had been sold by his brothers into slavery wound up in Egypt rose to prominence and he was instrumental during the time of famine to make sure everybody was fed uh, but he also brought his father and his sons and their, all their families down and that's how he, the Israelites ended up in Egypt in the first place now, when Jacob died in Egypt, he, he made Joseph take him and bury him in Canaan, where Abraham and Isaac and all their wives had been buried. But Joseph was buried in Egypt. And if you remember the time we, I preached a series through Genesis about a year ago, I made a, a, a strong point about why Joseph leaving his remains in Egypt was a very important uh, act of faith, uh, a reminder a, uh, to, the, to the coming Israelites to remind them to have some sense of continuity between this new generation and the generation past. But now uh, we're reminded that Joseph made his, uh, and his uh, descendants promise to take him out of there when they would leave, to take his bones and bury him in Canaan. But he said this that I think is a, is a statement that helped these uh, Israelite slaves in Egypt. It, it helped them carry on. 
Moses, uh, Joseph told them, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. See, uh, even if God hadn't sent Moses when he did, the, Isra the Israelites still had a promise that they were going to leave because Joseph says, God will take care of you, and you will carry my bones out of here. You will leave one day. Now, uh, we struggle with, I know what the end is, but I don't know when the end is. Do you struggle with that? I know there's heaven. I know Jesus is coming back, but I don't know when. And I wish I was the kind of preacher that could give you that answer. But if I was the kind of preacher that gave you that answer, I would, I would hope you would turn around and walk out because God hasn't given me that answer. God hasn't given any preacher that answer. And, and so, so they didn't know when, but they knew what. And we don't know when, but we know what. Our hope is Christ is returning. And our hope is built on the fact that he has risen from the dead. Christ is alive. And so we have hope, and, and we look at the story like this, and it says solidify our hope. The hope that they had is the same hope that we ought to possess today. They had, a, uh, they had these remains. They had this ancestor saying, God is going to take care of you. And, and you can almost hear the voices of, of godly men and women, saints who have come before us, and they, they said things similar to you in those times of, of, of struggle, of suffering. God will take care of you. And it wasn't empty words. It was, it was, uh, it was a confident declaration based on their experience in trusting the Lord. And so if you follow that example... Your time's going to come. Your time's going to come. Someone, someone you're going to see is struggling, a younger Christian, a newer Christian, and you have got the experience and you've got uh, the testimony and you can say to them, God will surely take care of you. How do I know? Because he's taking care of me. So they take the bones of Joseph. Um, God leads them by a pillar of... Uh, in the daytime, it's a pillar of cloud. In the nighttime, it's a pillar of fire. But they see the presence of God. Uh, they're, they, they're reminded. But then suddenly the story turns because Pharaoh has a change of mind. He, a few days pass, and, and he realizes that he really misses those Israelites. He, he loved them so much. No, he didn't, but he missed their work. He missed their labor. And he, he says, how foolish I was to to let them go. And so he says, I'm going to go get them back. So here are the Israelites. They've got the bones of Joseph, and they're remembering, he says, God will take care of you. They've got a pillar of cloud at day and a pillar of fire at night. It's God's presence leading them. God is right there. They can see him. And then suddenly here comes Pharaoh and his chariots, and suddenly they, they, don't, they forget that God is going to take care of them. They've had 10 plagues worth of God taking care of them. They've got God right there saying, I'm here taking care of you. They've got the bones of Joseph who says, God takes care of you. And now the Egypt's, the Egypt's coming and says, God, he's going to take care of us. And they, say to, they, they cry out to Moses. They say, is it, because, is it because there were not enough graves in Egypt? He brought us out here to die? But Moses steps up with his leadership and says, do not fear. Do not fear. Watch what God is going to do. And that's really what we ought to do. You guys are afraid of things. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't either. But here's what I know. God is going to take care of me. He's going to take care of you. And, and we have the words of Moses, stand back and watch God act. I think we misunderstand the gospel when we, when we really work our brains. Like, What do I have to do to make this work? And the gospel is, God is making it work. God is doing the work. You follow God. It's when we try to make our own plans and, and, and circumvent God's plan. That's when things get really uh, bad for us. And so he says, watch what, I, watch what God will do. And God says, yeah, watch what I'm going to do. Stretch your hand out, and sure enough, we read the sea parts. Now, the greatest story of salvation in the Old Testament. Today, we're... We, we've got a story that tops that, right? Jesus, the Son of God, he preached righteousness, he preached repentance, he preached the kingdom, and they killed him for it. He, he was nailed to a cross and laid in the grave. This, this man that people had left 
their jobs and their families for. They left everything for this man, and now he's dead in his tomb. What's going to happen? And then on the third day, they went to the tomb, and that stone had been rolled away. And, uh, and, and, and it was empty, and you read, we read earlier how Mary thought somebody had stolen the body. Uh, the disciples ran, and they, they were scared. Do I go in? Do I not go in? Leave it to Peter to be the guy that walks in, that he runs into the tomb, uh, not afraid of anything. But because of what that means, because it wasn't the fact that Jesus was born as a baby, it wasn't the fact that he died on the cross, it's the fact that he rose again that gives us hope. If he had only been born in a manger, what good is that? Lots of people are born of lowly circumstances. If he'd only died for our sins, so what? Many noble men have died for other people, and that didn't get us anything. But because he is alive today, that's why we have hope. That's why we have pledged to gather together corporately and worship. That's why we have given our life to Jesus. Not a, not a, 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 a pile of bones in a tomb, but an empty tomb, a, a Savior, the God-man in heaven at the right hand of God interceding on our, on our behalf. That is the greatest salvation. Because the, while the Israelites feared the, the Egyptians, we were fearing God's wrath. In fact, uh, when I think of this, when I think of my life before I knew Christ, and you might think of your life before you knew Christ, you, you were not the Israelite crossing the Red Sea. You were the Egyptian in the chariot chasing them. We were enemies of God. We had rebelled. And we deserve to have those, uh, those walls of the sea crash down on us and, and obliterate us. But God is so merciful that he let us come through. He, he saved us from certain death. And we have hope in that because Christ is alive. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. So what did the Israelites do after they came out on the other side? Did they just kind of just stand on the shore and look at the floating chariot wheels and the spears and say, yeah, I guess that wasn't so bad. We made it after all. No. They knew they could not take credit for this. This was God. And you know what they did? They sang a song. They had a worship service right there. They just, uh, they got the band together and they, they, they queued up the music and, and Moses led them in this worship song in chapter 15 of Exodus. He says, I will sing to the Lord. I wish I had the melody to this, but he says, I will sing to the Lord for he is Highly exalted, the horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. That's like the chorus of the song. The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. Now think about your own salvation. What, what is the horse and the rider that's been hurled in the sea? Is it your sins? Your transgressions? It's all your fears or your doubts? He's hurled that into the sea, and you are alive without any of that on your back. And so, uh, through the course of this, this song, you see it starts out with this great uh, chorus of praise. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. See that they have taken possession of God. He's no longer Jacob's God. He's not Joseph's God, and he's not even Moses' God anymore. He's my God. And I hope you have that uh, relationship with God today. He's not grandma's God. He's not daddy's God. He's not my Sunday school teacher's God. He's my God. He's my Jesus. He's my king. And no one's going to take him away from me. Because he's mine. I found him. He found me first. And I got him. And so it's a praise. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Do you know his name? The, the Lord, that was the name of God, Yahweh, the covenant name. And, I, and so our, the name we call on is Jesus, the Christ. He is the one who makes covenant with us. And so we embrace him. He, the, the, they sing of the defeat of the Egyptians in verse 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, he's cast into the sea. The choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths of like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them as a chaff. 
at the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw out my sword, my hand will destroy them. And you blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. And that's exactly what the devil wanted with every one of us. He pursued, he wanted to, to, to just like Jesus said to Peter, he wants to sift you like wheat. He wants, every, he wants you uh, not because he's gonna, he has anything to offer you, but he wants to keep you from God. He wants you to stay in bondage to sin, but you have been rescued from that. God has acted. You couldn't fight the devil. You can't fight temptation on your own. You need supernatural help, and it was God who did that in Jesus Christ through you, for you. So as the, as the Israelites sing about God uh, destroying the, uh, the arrogant Egyptians, we sing a song of how sin has been defeated by Christ. And so it goes back to praise, and we understand th this salvation comes from nowhere else. There's, we didn't have options. We either accept Christ or, or we, we are stuck paying for our own sins. And in verse 11, uh, they sing, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? The answer is nobody. Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Nobody. Awesome is praises, working wonders. Nobody. You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. And I love that verse 13 because in, in, in dealing with, I mean, you got a picture of God's strength and his wrath and his warlike nature is, and how he's, he's on, the, uh, on the offense. He's, he's fighting battles. But then here comes this word that we've got to know in our hearts. We've got to keep this word in verse 13. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. Loving kindness is a Hebrew word, uh, he said, uh, is the best way I can pronounce it. Uh, uh, you can spell it, uh, an English way to spell it, C-H-E-S-E-D, he said. And so loving kindness, uh, the word we're probably more familiar with these days is mercy. This warrior God showed mercy to the people whom he redeemed people he chose to redeem. Remember, he did, Israel didn't deserve mercy. They weren't any more righteous than the Egyptians. They were just the ones he, he loved. You and I weren't more righteous than anybody on this block. You weren't more righteous than your classmates. You weren't righteous than your co-workers. God chose to offer redemption. In his mercy, he invited you to come to the kingdom, to find salvation, and no one else was offering that to you. No one who could certainly give you anything. In verse 14, uh, they take note of how the rest of the, the known world around them uh, viewed these events. The people have heard, and I've mentioned that before, uh, the stories of the plagues and the stories of the Red Sea was traveling fast. And, and there was, there was, uh, it's amazing how fast it got around the world. He says the people have heard and they tremble. The, uh, uh, the, the anguish has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling, grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. And, and if you remember uh, your stories from uh, the fall of Jericho and those spies went into the woman Rahab and uh, she said, we are scared to death. We heard you were coming and we don't know what to do. We're dead people. Save us. Rescue me. And, and today, if you look around and see how, what the attitude toward Christianity is, you don't see, I don't get the same impression. I don't see a world trembling. I don't see a world in anguish. 
uh, shaking in their boots at the thought of Jesus Christ returning, they laugh. But there's no doubt, if you go back to the beginnings, when Christ rose and his disciples went forth, it changed the world. It turned it upside down. And, and, and nations did shake at the prospect. Uh, and, and, and his influence has gone all around the globe. But now we see it turning on us, right? We see his influence, it seems to be shrinking. Uh, it's like we're a post-Christian nation, a post-Christian world. And, and, and uh, he, he's not... He's, the thought of God isn't scaring people, but I tell you what, we know he's coming again. And, and, and when he does return, I guarantee you, jaws will drop, knees will get turned to jelly, people will, will shriek, and it'll be too late for them to do anything about it. And that's why we have got to continue to hold up Jesus as the testimony, and as We've got to keep sharing the gospel because many still will believe. It seems like no one wants to hear it, but there are, there are still uh, souls ready to heart. So we continue to pray on that. Now, the Israelites also, in their song, they, they know something that, that we know so much about, and they seem to... Uh, now, in their context, they were looking more physically, but, but we can see the spiritual implications of it. In verse 17, it says, You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Now, in their context, they're thinking of Canaan, right? You are leading us to your inheritance. Canaan was the inheritance. Uh, and and when, when Joshua takes them across the Jordan River and they begin to uh, move into the land and conquer the cities and, and establish uh, the lots for the tribes, they call it their inheritance. The tribe of Judah received his inheritance. The tribe of uh, 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 Benjamin received, received, I'm forgetting the names of the 12 tribes. And so he, uh, uh, they begin to receive their inheritance. But we know, we know something about inheritance, don't we, as Christians? We know that, that uh, in the resurrection, we are going to receive the rewards. We're going to receive all of his, his glory and his riches. We call that an inheritance. And we're, we're looking for a land also. And I got news for you. It ain't Texas. And it ain't Israel. It, it's better. It's the entire globe. The, the, the blessed are the, what is it, the meek? They shall inherit the what? Earth, not the city. They're going to inherit the earth. See, we talk about going to heaven, and when you leave this earth, uh, your spirit departs from your body, and you go to be with the Lord. Absolutely, I, 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 that's, a, that's a guarantee. But one day, when that last trumpet blasts, heaven is coming down this earth will be redeemed restored to its original condition that God wanted before sin entered this world and, 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 and just destroyed everything and tore it all up he's going to redeem and, and recreate it, it's a brand new world, a brand new earth and this is where we are going to live with God for eternity it's our inheritance so he's leading us along. See, like I said earlier, I know the end, but I don't know the when. And so I know that, that uh, you know, life is pretty great down here right now, but can you imagine when he make, restores it to its original condition before the serpent deceives our great-grandparents? We ain't seen nothing yet. And so we have this inheritance. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Remember that. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. He doesn't reign for a little bit. He doesn't reign for a day. He doesn't reign just when the sun shines. I got to tell you, I just stopped for a second. I, I can't remember uh, what, what Easter was like last year, but, but in my time here, it seems like more times than not, it has been storming on Easter Sunday. And it's been so miserable. 
I'm glad for some sunshine today. Uh, and, and it reminds me that the Lord reigns forever. But not that I thought when I came to church on Easter Sunday a couple years ago and it was thunder and lightning and we thought the lights were going to go out, I wasn't going around saying, man, the Lord, I guess his reign's over. No, of course not. But, but aren't you glad for those reminders? And so the sun is shining and the God is reigning and he's going to reign forever and ever. And I know you, you, watch, you turn on the television, you see some headlines, and you're like, oh no, what do we do? Well, guess what? None of that is going to knock God off of his throne. He is greater than those headlines, and he's greater than all the fear-mongering you hear on the news, and you don't have to worry about any of that because God is in control, and nothing is going to unseat Christ from his throne. He is still the King of kings. He is still the Lord of lords, and none of that is going to take away your salvation. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And then the final reprieve for the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea on them. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea. Every day is an opportunity for us to walk on dry land and to realize we are on dry land. Because we walk around and we, we see... We see things that are like chariots to us. We, we see enemies all around us. We, we think someone's going to bring us down. We think the devil's uh, coming at us, and he, he certainly is like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. But you don't have to be afraid because you are walking on dry ground. And let God uh, confuse those enemies. Let God bring things crashing on them. Let them get stuck in the mire. Let them get uh, uh, flooded by the waters. And you keep walking on that dry land that Christ has placed you on when he puts you out of the mire and sets you on the solid rock. That is what faith is leading you to do. And that's why we're worshiping. And that's why we will continue. Easter ain't over when we say the last amen in our prayer. Is it, Randy? Easter ain't over. And, 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 and we're not going to put the resurrection back in a box and get it out next year. We're going to keep celebrating the risen Savior every moment of our walk in Christ. And I hope you have that kind of faith today, but I want to say to you, if you don't, if, you, if you're not sure, you know, um, don't wait. The song that the Israelites sang, they sang because they had been saved. And I wonder if you're saved today. I'm saved today, not because of anything I did, but because of what Christ did for you. And so you say, what do I have to do to be saved? You don't have to do anything. Just believe what he did. Trust it. Take hold of it. He's got a gift for you. He, he died for every one of your sins. There's not one person in this room that Jesus didn't die for. I promise you that. There's not one of you that Jesus didn't die for. And if he died for you, that means he wants to be with you for eternity. In fact, the, the Great Commission... When he says, go into all the world and make disciples, baptize, teach them everything I've said, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that's what Jesus wants. He wants to be with you forever. How can you say no to that? Say yes to that. Turn to him. Turn from your sin. Turn from that life of pursuit of things that, that uh, end up getting washed away by floods just in pursue Christ. He has held out his hands and he's offering you redemption, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and inheritance of glory. And it's free to you if you'll receive it.